Okay, welcome to this Traders Helping Traders session. THT is a series of materials presented by traders who trade the apexinvesting.com trading systems created by Daryl Martin. The purpose is to help you see how we ordinary traders apply the systems and tools provided by Atex Apex every day in our own trading. Of course, the normal disclosures of trading apply. It involves risks and all that stuff. Please see apexinvesting.net for full disclosures. Any THT webinar that is done is not a substitute for watching the training videos. It's a bonus. Today's video is presented by me, Lori, and the topic is misconceptions when using the power play setups. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get started. Um, I'm going to start running through the forum post and um, there is so many misconceptions I'm seeing that I don't think I'm going to be able to get to all of them today. I don't want this webinar to last five hours long. Nobody will watch it. Nobody will learn a thing. So I want to try to keep it reasonably short. And if your question's not answered, I'm going to keep track of it. I'm going to try to stay on track of what I'm actually looking at. And so if there's a lot of questions that don't pertain exactly to what I'm looking at, I'm going to keep track of them and we'll do several videos if we need to. Um, this is going to help John determine what he needs to do for the actual official videos, which at this time are not out. So I want to thank all the people that have been putting charts in and asking questions because that's what, that's, that's what let me know we had so many misconceptions and we needed to do this. There are a ton of things that people are not understanding and I don't know, I thought it was pretty clear. So we're going to try and squash those misconceptions and um, get you guys on the right track. So I'm going to just start at the top of this power play forum post and kind of go through it and explain some of this stuff. And um, I have a list of stuff I want to cover. We may or may not get it all covered. The key is going to be to keep it fairly reasonable in length. And oh, of course, got to have the phone ringing. Um, but, um, sorry about that. Um, I got a lot to cover, so let's just go ahead and get started. Okay. In uh, there's four types of power plays and there's different types for different market conditions. You really don't just sit there and watch for all four types all the time. Um, the key is the first two are in a non-trending market, but yet not real choppy. Uh, you want it to be, it's kind of when it's going just up and down and wide chop, maybe. I mean, real wide chop, maybe. What are you showing, Lori? Can you see the forum post? There's some kind of noise. Okay, does this help at all? You just see the screenshot. That's what I've got up there. It's just a screenshot for now. Okay. Um, is there still noise in the audio? Real bad. Okay. I'm just going to run with it then. Okay. Move the phone out of the way and then that will. Okay. Okay. So f I'm just going to run through and explain this stuff in better detail. And then I've got a chart underneath it we'll look at the chart and see what we can find for questions and I mean see what we can do for answering questions on on today's chart or just whatever we need to do okay so th there's there's the first type of power play the first two really are for a market that's not going in one direction all day long or for hours at a time anyway and it's not real tight chop it's just kind of in between it's really important to know when to look for each type. The number, the first type of power play, for example, and the second time type of power play here, they're really close to each other as far as the type of power play. And they, they use the same type. You see, you didn't have a big trend. You didn't have tight, tight chop. 
that's that's when you want to use one and two. Half the battle is knowing when to use which setup. Okay, then number three, that is for a trending market. You see how this went and trended for quite a long time. And what you're looking for here is when when you have a pullback from a trend. So that's when you look, when you've got those big trends and you, you're sitting there wondering, hmm, if I get in now, is it going to reverse? Is it done trending? How do I know when I can get in? How do I, how do I know if I can get in and this trend isn't going to reverse on me right away? I mean, I have that problem all the time. Now, I finally, we'll be able to get on in on trend. I've always hated the days that it just trends straight through because I could never get in on those. I was always afraid that it's too close to the end. Well, this will tell you, number three, hidden divergence. When you see that, it indicates it's going to continue its main trend. And then what happens when you're in a really choppy market? Right here, tight chop. Number four is going to tell you how to trade coming out of the tight chop. Not how to trade while you're in the chop. That's just kind of the old fashioned ping pong, which takes a lot of practice. And it only, that only is good in certain ping pong or chop conditions. But anyway, those are the basics. I've tried to even include it in the first um, line of each post. Um, a breakout when it slaps in tight chop and um, the net the other ones are in a non-trending market it tells you in a non-trending market and then number three is look for the setup while in a clear trend so kind of you know hopefully will tell you when to use each power play so that's the first thing I wanted to cover. Okay, then we're gonna, I'm just gonna show you this real quick. And I was looking for examples. I was trying to get um, screenshots in here today and I really didn't find one I liked. I didn't go back very far. So I put this one up, but it's not my favorite. Um, it's not a really good example. But you had the market trending down and this trend is not real huge compared to this trend so we can use it as a comparison anyway it comes up a little bit and it stopped and it pulled back some and you can see when it stopped at its height you look at the VAD and you notice how big it was okay and there's a yellow line to show where the VAD was it retraced a little bit and as it reaches the same point now I'm looking for, um, in this case, I wanted to go a little bit further, and it did, and it stopped. And when it went further, right here, then I had, uh, you had less VAD volume. It did not even come up to the same level that the other one did. So with less VAD volume, that indicates when it closes short, as long as it's not a big as long as it only went a little bit further, that indicates a short in this case because it was going up and it indicates a reversal to go short. And you would enter after the bar close. In this case, you had a strong level right here. You'd want to make sure that you let the price get past this level. And then if you missed, if you missed that entry, look at that beautiful, perfect touch back there could have got in somewhere along this bar if you missed the first entry. A touchback will almost always have, or a touchback, I'm sorry, a power play will almost always have secondary and entries and beyond it because they're the bigger plays. These entries are usually the plays that are going to be 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 ticks in a short period of time. Um, it indicates a, a Ari has a question. It indicates a short because there was less VAD on a higher high. Exactly. So it indicates that from this point, it's going to reverse and go down. And I don't believe, yeah, I didn't get a screenshot showing if it were in a downtrend and it reversed up. But we'll get screenshots to fill in all these little blanks in the forum post. But yeah, you had, um, and you want to compare reasonable trends. For example, 
Here's a good example of when not to use it. You had a big trend down, then you came up and, and it went, um, it came up and came back down here. So you had a, a low here and then it passed that low just a little bit and it had less volume. So that looks awesome for reversal in this case. I mean, you had a, just a little bit further, which is you re really want just a little bit further. That, that was awesome there. And then you've got your VAD divergence. That's a whole lot less volume, but it went further. This would not be a case of us, one of these reversals because you had, look at this large trend where this VAD was adding up all that time. And then you have a three bar trend. You cannot compare three bars to all these bars. Of course you're going to have almost, you know, nothing comparatively. It's gonna, there's not gonna be any volume compared to this, no matter what you do. So you cannot, you cannot use an entry like this and in this case, you can see it continued to trend down, but you can't, you have to use somewhat of a like um, small trend. I mean, it doesn't have to be small. If it went back all the way up, then you could, you could use that point then, but you, you just, you can't use it when it's a large trend compared to a very small trend. Um, so was the star E a fake out? Um, yeah, pretty much was. Unless you had your stop behind the E where you really it should be, it then it would have went. It was just taking a little breath before it went again. So it really technically, I can't tell if it's exactly, it looks like it might have been exact. It might have been a tick above, but I believe the stop would be, what is it, one to three ticks? I kind of forget. I haven't traded that one for a while. On an E, it should be at least on the other side of the E bar. So that E wouldn't necessarily have been so fake. It would have been really close. Three ticks above. Okay, thanks. So you're, you wouldn't have been stopped out if your stop was in the right place. Okay, so that's the first um, type. And um, it really, you want to you wanna compare trends and I don't I haven't quantified it yet as far as what size you know three bars compared to five well actually I think that's four but still it's reasonably close versus this you know a lot of bars comparing by three no do not do not think that this is one of those setups so the divergence right after that is a better comparison. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. You, you don't, when you're in a downtrend, then you don't even look for that setup. When you're in a big long trend like this, the only setup you would look for would be the number three setup, which is hidden divergence from 1029 to 1037. From 10... on this chart or the other one? I'm not really sure of what you're talking about. Because we can't even really look at this down here, that chart, okay. We, we can't look at, we don't know that it's about to reverse and it's still in this downtrend. It's, I mean, th the way you can start to tell is the VAT is consistently on both sides, little. That's a really good indication that it's gonna start to reverse. But until we've got some consistency there, we really don't know. So, uh, Mike just asked about VAD E. In this stuff, we don't use VAD E very much at all. You can, I have it on my chart and I'd like to watch it for staying in a trade, but for these setups, you really don't need to use VAD E. I mean, some people like to, they don't like to take a trade against VAD E. Okay, make that be one of your added in confirmations. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not necessary from what I've seen on these setups. So you would, the only, when you see a big long trend like this, the only one of these setups you're gonna be looking for 
to make an entry is hidden divergence, which we will talk about in just a little bit. And then when you get to the end of a trend, you might have an idea it's getting to the end when both sides of the VAD are very small. It doesn't mean you just automatically go in and take it going the other way because you have to wait until it tells you there's a reason to go the other way. But when both sides of the VAD are very small, you've got chop. Or you've got indecision. You don't have much of anything clear is really what you have. Um, I've had some people say that they need to they need to, um, more instruction on how to draw the chop box, where the chop box would be, and how to read the VAD. The VAD is, um, well, it's not too tough, but um, let's move on to the next one, and we can come back if we need to. Okay, we've got another one in the non-trending market when the price puts up a higher, no, a lower high, not even I'm getting them mixed up, and the VAD A shows a much higher, okay, that would be here, is the example. You've got, it made a high, okay? Then he comes down and it comes back up and it makes almost as high a high, but not quite. And yet, look at this VAD. You had a huge VAD here, close to the same size trends. We want to compare the same, approximately the same things. You've got a lot of volume here, and yet it couldn't quite even hit the high of the day. So this is a really good indication that eh, it's, it's not going to, if you're looking for a chop breakout, it's not going to break here. That's for sure. And it is probably going to head short with settlement in here. That makes it a little bit trickier because settlement is so strong. But then if you got in, you, you always want to put your stops at the top of the bar that you're looking at. For example, if, my, if I'm looking at this, you'd actually enter down here, but your stop would have to be here. And it would not have stopped you out going up here and coming down. But I don't know where the cluster was in this. That's another thing. You have to, you have, to have a cluster for all these. And I don't have the um, OP charts on all these. I know they all did have clusters when I uh, took the screenshots. But I don't know exactly where because I didn't get the OP in there. Um, when we're comparing VAD, are we doing it only with the highest point of the day or just with anything high? You're comparing it to the previous point that the price went to. The price went to a high here. This is where you're comparing it from. It came down and it went back up. So you're comparing the VAD at this point to the VAD at this point. And so it's this VAD compared to this VAD. As, are you guys all seeing the um, the arrow, the pointer, okay? Because I know sometimes there's an issue with the pointer. Okay, good. That's just want to make sure. I don't want to get through the whole thing and then realize that oh, you couldn't see the pointer. Okay, good deal. Good deal. So in this one, um, the same price was tested even a third time. So the, the biggest mistake that I see people make is, I am recording, the biggest mistake that I see people make is they see a cluster and they jump in. Um, the, you, you don't want to get caught in that. And I'm going to go over that in a little bit um, when I get through these next two types of trades. And this is what we were talking about. I'm going to see if I can pop this one up bigger. Okay, good. I can. Um, you have an overall uptrend. Okay, and here you have a low point. Then it comes down here and you have a higher low. It did not come that low. Okay, your, um, your VAD came down. You had quite a bit of VAD. You had a higher low and your VAD, the, so you've got nothing. Nothing remarkable to trade from right here on these power plays. So we go up and we have 
another retrace, which makes another low. And it also is unremarkable compared to the previous one. So again, we don't have anything. And it's right through settlement, probably choppy. Okay, and then the price goes up again. Price action goes up, and it stops, and it retraces. Now here we have another higher low. It's higher than this low on the retrace. So you have a higher low. But if you look at this VAD, wow, you got a lot more VAD than you did previously and even previously here. Those that's that's huge. That's what's called hidden divergence. You had a a on the retrace you had a higher a lot more VAD, but it was a higher low or a higher reversal. So when you have that, we also had the cluster uh, which was this first pullback bar and so you had the cluster so that was your first clue you had a cluster alert going off here then so we're gonna watch for okay we're in a trend we have a cluster we're in a trend so the only thing that we can really look for at this point is hidden divergence are we gonna continue or is it gonna retrace so we look down at our VAD, sure enough, we've got a lot more VAD than the previous time and even the previous time than that on the shorts. And so, yeah, we're going up and you can, you could, there's, if you wanted a real aggressive entry, you could take it at the close of this bar going up. I tend to take them at the close of the chop box and go up. Does that is that clear at all how that works hidden divergence is the hardest one to understand so with hidden divergence we only look at the VAD on the retraces yes ma'am that is true you have to have a clear trend and you look at the retraces and that's why they call it hidden because it's not it's not the obvious price action it's the less obvious and in this case our cluster was a you always listen for your cluster first listen for that alert it'll go off and when you hear it go off then you look okay where are my levels do I have a level yep we have a level right at settlement okay did I have chop well yeah I had a little bit of chop here it went up on a sling it chopped in this bar we had another sling it chopped here it came down here it chopped we had a long timer bar on that bar before you know no it was a cluster bar that was the longer timer bar and so we had a little bit of chop it was tight tight chop so you don't have a lot of um, you don't have a lot of bars and it doesn't look so messy but if you're watching this real time you'll see the price is going up and down and up and down on these bars and so you have a real tight chop and that is that does count for your chop and then VAD told you when to go it had a lot of divergence here a lot more volume a lot of not divergence hidden divergence it had a lot more VAD volume than the previous time so when it closes up you're going up and that's just what happened this is actually one of my favorites it is one of the stronger setups and um, the problem is, is you don't have nice big trends every day, so it doesn't happen as often. But it's great when you understand it and you and you and you see it. This is absolutely fabulous. One of my favorites. Okay, so let's see if I can go back to the post. I just want to run through them all. Um, another hidden divergence on this one only going short so the retrace going up and there was a cluster bar in here if I'm not mistaken I kind of remember this one there's a cluster bar up in here somewhere and you had a nice pretty solid downtrend there and so you had the retrace it came down and you had another retrace you had a lower high 
here's your mark and you had a lower high but if you look at VAD you had a lot more VAD and that's probably a little tough to see I'll pop it up here okay so you had a retrace price came down it retraced again and it was a little lower high look at what the VAD's doing the VAD showed a higher bar it's kinda like when they don't agree your your price went lower on your retrace but your VAD went higher so when they don't agree on a nice long trend that tells you your trend is likely to continue and then there you go you could take the swing you could take it as soon as this bar closed but that that is hidden divergence okay so the last one we will look at is the good old coil chop you can't take any of these without a cluster you're absolutely right you need a cluster for any of these and I'll go over that in a lot more detail in a minute um, here's your um, well you had three clusters in a row and I have commented several times that if you've got clusters in a row you're gonna have chop and that's exactly what happened you had a lot of chop here and I always have said if you have a lot of mini magnets when you're using a diagnostic bar if you have a lot of mini magnets in one area you're going to have chop and here you had an old mini magnet here you had an old mini magnet here you had one from before here you've got a new one it's telling you you got some chop going on in the area you had a new one here okay and the clusters confirm it three clusters and lots of chop okay and then this one you've got the the tight coil chop um, we heard that here we would have heard the cluster alert go off cluster on NQ okay got that where's our volley or where's our our level we need to we need to first thing when we hear that cluster go off look for a level where's our level well on the C's chart it shows pretty clear we, we're at settlement you can't get a stronger level than that okay so we got settlement where's our chop when this alert went off we didn't have chop yet and this is why I say just because you have a cluster does not mean you have an entry you don't want to enter right there you would have probably entered going up you would have got kicked so in this case you saw there's a cluster you wait it out until it tells you what you wanted to what it's going to do what it's more likely to do so you have the next cluster oh we got two clusters side by side then I'm really thinking yeah we got some chop coming for sure and then a third cluster oh my gosh and actually look at how long this took 1251 it finally started breaking out at 1342 close to an hour of chop here those are really I love those ones because that's that's telling you you're probably gonna go somewhere when you come out of it you had a lot of time to watch it and and get the trade ready be you know paying attention and just when you're really getting bored and you go for a cup of coffee that's when it's gonna break out because it takes so long but those long ones are the absolute best and then um, if you look over here you you want chop has to be a component to every power play so you have chop and here on the C's chart it showed you your chop went it's hard to see but it went just a little below this box and if you look at the volume on VAD it wasn't even meeting the last time it hit the box so that means you got less volume going a little bit further it is not breaking out there's a really good chance that it is not breaking out I mean anything can happen to the market we know that but yeah that's not gonna not 99 percent chance that is not gonna break out there in fact the fact that it came below the box is kind of a fake out before every big move you have a fake break 
almost every single big move you have a fake break I love to see those um, fake outs because as long as you don't get caught in them that's a f that's a really good clue you're about to have a good breakout and then you have a break to the long side and VAD did not give you a really good clue that it was going to break up here and normally you want to see the VAD growing you don't want the first bar to be huge because that generally will burn out if the first bar on its retrace going up in this tight tight chop if the first bar is really big chances are it's, if it goes out it's gonna it's gonna fake because it's gonna burn out fast but VAD did not give us a good indication it, it slowly grew which is what we want to see but it didn't grow better than this side so in this case the VAD wasn't very wasn't cooperating real well but and that's why I have this example up OP was our our absolute confirmation on this one if you look at this you had a huge red net 627 I think that says and um, compared to 62 what is that 45 or something 118 100 comparatively speaking you had a huge amount of net shorts here and the market couldn't go down if you watch this you would have watched the the cells pile in and yet the market was not moving and then you have what is this maybe 58 it looks like that might be that number I can't tell my chop boxes in the way but you have a relatively small number and it kind of pushes it right back up and it closes up and then a huge number comparatively speaking going back down and it doesn't even push it to the bottom of the previous bar that's pretty big if you're watching this that is huge to see real time that it had it tried its darndest to get this to push down and it would not go and on this one I happen to see this oh I love this one and by the time it closes up near that box I'm gonna put an order and have it sitting here and I'm gonna ride that thing right up I just I love that one and so that's a time where VAD was not real helpful it didn't give us a clear indication but order prints picked up the slack and just made it clear as clear can be and there's no there, there's no doubt that 627 contracts going short compared to 62 100 I mean that's a huge difference and that's what we're looking for that's what triggered all the clusters I'm sure so it shows you it's chop but there was a huge battle going on here and it was very clear who was winning it was not the short side so that's just a little something to watch when you're watching OP for that kind of stuff okay so those are our four types of power plays and when to watch them if you're in the middle of chop watch for the okay if you're in the middle of tight coil type chop this is the way what you're looking for this play if you are in a trending market you're going to look for hidden divergence if you're in a just a market that's going up and down kind of whatever you know not not a real big trend but not real tight chop like you see here then you're gonna look for the double tops with the more VAD or a little less I mean a little a little higher or a little lower but you don't want it to go too far because then it kind of resets everything and you really don't know you don't have a good indication um, is there a good way to show the net numbers as a percentage um, I understand what you're saying yes it makes sense but there isn't a way to do it at this point not to say there won't be later but for now there isn't Um, somebody just called out a, a mistake in here. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom past it and I'll check it out later and correct it. As far as a higher high or a lower low, I may have said 
one of the wrong terms. Okay, so that's basically the four types. So now you have an idea of what you're looking for when. And that's one thing I was seeing. People didn't know what to look for when. Um, and they were just looking for anything, anytime. But you got to know what you're, what kind of a market are you dealing with and then what trade to look for. Okay, so I've been kind of keeping tabs on where people are making mistakes and where they're understanding things incorrectly. And um, so here's a few things. Um, when you're looking for a power play, okay, the first thing is you hear that cluster alert go off. That is your first, I mean, always be watching, of course, to see what it's doing, what your market's doing, and you can be prepared. Sometimes you might see something setting up and you haven't had a cluster. So you can be prepared when you do have the cluster, but the first thing you need is a, is a cluster. Once you have a cluster, start looking for your levels. Do you have a level or is it in the middle of nowhere? If it's in the middle of nowhere, you might have, you might have a scalp. I mean, just because you don't have a good setup doesn't mean you couldn't necessarily take a scalp. Um, with these power plays are what I've noticed to get you the fast, bigger moves in a short period of time. This is what seems to constitute those moves. So you may have shorter moves, you may have smaller little scalps, or you may have something that might overall take a few hours. And if you're willing to sit in it that long, then yeah, you might be just fine to, you know, get in that. But a power play is just that. It's a powerful move that happens fairly quickly. And, it, and it's a fairly good size move. Um, anywhere between, well, I always protect, um, I recommend to protect at ten, your scalp entries at 10 ticks and um, your trend entries, you could trail it with the MVP, with Daryl's different options he has on his IZSS chart, or you can... Um, Or you can um, target different areas but I would always recommend bringing your stop up to um, protect ticks rather than take profit um, because if you just take profit if you pull your target down and take profit you're denying yourself any chance of getting any more ticks and if you pull your stop up to protect profits then you know you can't do any worse than that, but yep, you might do better. And today's chart was a really good example of that for me. I was hoping to get a 10 tick scalp. I thought, well, you know, if I get a 10 tick on this, that's great. And if my trend breaks even, then that's okay. Because I knew it was a second day of Yellen testifying and before Congress, and I did not. I just didn't think we were going to have a lot of good moves. So I thought, well, I see kind of a good little chop bounce. I'll go ahead and take 10 ticks to the top of the chop box. Well, I'm glad I didn't just take a target, put my target down, because that ended up giving me, uh, from the two contracts, 120 ticks. So 10 versus 120, yeah, I'm going to bring my, my take profit. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to bring my stop up. Okay, what qualifies as a level of importance? Um, that is in the C's post itself. And um, the, the stronger the level would be a deviation or ice line. Those are the strongest levels, highs of the days, lows of the days. Um, those, are the, those are the best levels. And we have power lines are good strong levels. Um, even sometimes a chop box, if it's touched the top of the chop box a lot, then sometimes that'll even give you, usually if it does that, there's a mini magnet. And that mini magnet will be something that you could bounce off. But that's, you really want, for a, the bigger the move, the stronger the level. Okay, can you protect behind volume nodes, power lines, magnets? Yes, Ivara, you can. That's exactly what I like to do. Exactly. Let me see. 
Um, okay, same one there. So looking for a screenshot that I'm not finding. Okay, well. finding it. Sorry. I wanted a very specific screenshot from Okay, another double there from this morning actually, but I'll just let it go. Okay, let me see questions here. In hidden divergence does VAD A in the trend direction need to be increasing? I don't care what VAD A is doing in the trend direction. Um, because I will show you why I don't care. Okay. You've got a trend here and VAD is adding up here. This is going to cause VAD to start over. This is going to cause VAD to start over. So overall, your VAD, once it hits this point, you got strong VAD, and then it's not going to be real strong because it keeps having these little t retraces and that's going to start the recount for our trend volume it's going to start over so we don't care in the hidden divergence we really don't care if the trend direction vat is growing or what it's doing you want to pay attention to the the pullback vat and it's kind of a hidden thing so hidden divergence is a really good name for it if you move your stop as soon as you get X ticks, aren't you likely to get stopped out? How many ticks ahead of the protect should you have? Yes, Dennis. Um, if you, for example, um, where is it? Okay, let's just look at this. Okay, on this trade, whatever day this was, I got in and I protected 10 ticks. But it was moving so quickly that it moved away from my 10 ticks and it did not take me out. It did not, didn't take the 10 ticks out. Now I left my trend alone at that point because I wanted to give it space to go. And then I protect 20 ticks. Generally for me, I protect 10 and then I protect 20 and then I protect 30. Or it depends kind of how strong, if I'm getting more signals that confirm I'm gonna keep going. If I was in a trend and I saw hidden divergence, for example, I'm gonna let that thing go. I'm gonna give it room. I'm not gonna pull up and protect fast. I'm gonna just let it go. But I do, once I, once I take profit on my scalp, then I pull my, my trend up to break even plus a few ticks and that's how I personally do it okay um, if you move your stop let's see oh I, I wanted to say something else on that Dennis if if you move your stop be prepared you're there's a really good chance you're going to get stopped out there I mean nine times out of ten if you move your stop to protect ten ticks you are going to get knocked out at ten ticks absolutely the only thing is I mean you could have you could have had a target at ten ticks most of the time it's not going to be different however times when it is oh it's so well worth it I mean D Daryl always says let your runners run well I'm starting to finally get that just took me a little while and that's why I put the two the two contracts in because if I get my scalp I'm a scalper by nature if I get my scalp I can leave this one as long as I'm at break even plus a tick or two or three I can leave this one go with a lot more room and it you know I already got my scalp which is what I would have had anyway so that's how I play head games with myself in order to let it go um, do you want do you one stop move at a time? Do I move? Yes, I move my stops individually and I move one at a time. Yes. After a power play, if missed, can you enter on a touchback to a mini magnet? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. The thing about a power play, a true power play, if you missed it, 
let's just say this power play happened and you totally missed it until you got up. All of a sudden you look here and you're going, oh, that looks like a power play. Or even it gets up to here when this, um, where, where I took profit, it's coming over this um, high point, um, this swing high, and you're thinking, ah, oh, geez, that, that was a, I missed it. Well, look for your next entry. Swing past the power point, or po swing past the high, the swing high, there's an entry. Uh, you've got an elevator entry. You have, you know, wait and see. You didn't have any mini magnets on here, but if you would have had, for example, a mini magnet laid down right here on this elevator, oh man, I would have been all about that one. That's when it's really, when you hit a true power play that that is strong signals bouncing off a strong line. You see how that bounced off settlement perfectly. That's a classic, amazing setup. I love those when they bounce off really perfect. Not that they do it all the time. They don't. But the better the setup, the stronger the play. The play, And usually the longer it goes. Usually. Of course, everything, the market, anything can happen. So anyway, um, yes, you can take the secondary entries. Even if you miss the power play, that's when a good time to watch for hidden divergence. Now here we couldn't watch for hidden divergence because there was no other lows on the pullbacks to compare to. So this first one, we cannot look for any hidden divergence. There's nothing to compare it to. So we're just looking at the old fashioned elevator or C stars at that point. If you've got a starred entry, that would be a good time to take it. Um, and, and looking at things like mini magnets, um, you had another cluster here. And again, um, I, uh, you had a cluster here. This cluster, if you look here, this cluster, in hindsight, we can see this. It's not always easy to see real time, but in hindsight, we can see that this cluster popped up. And what happened? We had some chop. It, it tells us something is going to change. When a cluster pops up, there's, there's something is going to happen. What happened? We had a little bit of chop. That's what happened. It's, you know, it, it's a good thing. I mean, in, in this case, I, I stopped my, I protected my scalp. And yep, it got stopped out with that. And that was okay. And that's why I protected, really, probably, because I saw that cluster. So I'm going to pull my scalp up and protect tighter. But they're really, I mean, at that point, even my trend I probably had at the bottom of this bar. I, I honestly don't remember where I had the, but to hide your your stop down here, so that if it comes down further, you know, you're gonna you're gonna protect what you got, but you're not gonna protect so tight because it could be a continuation. You just you don't know what it's gonna be. What type of power play screenshot are we looking at? Um, well, we had. We didn't have a trending market at that point. We had, it was, we went down on, it came down, let's see. This was right at open, okay. I gotta get, get my market conditions here. Here, um, it came down and it tested settlement and then it op uh, the market opened and it came down. At market open, I tend to see an awful lot where it goes one direction and it, for a little bit and it'll reverse. And I believe that's what happened here. It came down a little bit, tested settlement, and went back up. Um, this would be, it would, it came down and hit the same and then you've got a lot less. So it's kind of. And in between, actually, it didn't come down any further. Doesn't look like it came down any further. Did it? No, nope. doesn't look like it came down any further, but it had a lot less VAD volume on the bounce off settlement. And since settlement is so strong and it had a mini magnet, no, it didn't. This isn't the same area. Sorry, that's way later. No, it's not. I'm looking at the wrong one. Okay, it did not have a mini magnet in here. 
it had a cluster earlier and then just a lot less volume as it bounced off settlement. The settlement, it'll bounce a lot, so that was kind of a little bit of an aggressive shot there. I just took a bunch of screenshots. This was just one of a screenshot that I had taken of my read on the market. Okay, let me see. Looking at questions here. How many ticks past the 10 tick mark do you let the market go up before moving my stop to 10 ticks? That totally depends on the market. Um, if it's hesitating and really having a hard time getting to my 10 ticks and it's just not doing much, I'll pull it up and protect 10 fa as fast as I can. If it is kind of looking like it's, if it kind of gets to five and then all of a sudden it'll zip up maybe to 10 or 12, then I'm gonna give it a little bit more room because you've got a little momentum it's building. And I don't want it to stop me out at 10. If it's got some momentum building, I wanna to try to get a little more. So I'm kind of reading the market. I'm, I'm watching a little bit of OP and just trying to see how, the timer bar, see how fast things are moving. Uh, reading questions here. What type of power? Okay, we got that one. Traditional VAD A entry. I'm not sure what a traditional VAD A entry is. Um, that was just basically a bounce off settlement with VAD hugely different, telling me it was likely to bounce. And at that point, what I was probably looking at was a bounce to, if it was gonna chop, which it very well could have chopped, but I had a lot of room and I was gonna probably go to here and then it probably zipped up is what I would tend to guess. I like to take these little, when it looks uniform, this is my, this is my ping pong chop that everybody always asks about. You've got uniform chop up, down, and it came to the same spot, bounced off settlement. I'm figuring, ah, we're gonna probably get it going up to at least this point. And we had VAD telling us, yeah, it, we didn't have any volume there. It's probably gonna go. And by protecting profit instead of taking, taking profit at the top, I actually let it go and get a few more. So that was what that entry is. It took me a little while to figure out to get into that one. Um, isn't that a long move VAD compared to a short move with less VAD? Um, it's really not, um, you, it, went, it hit the same place. I would have loved for it to go down just a couple ticks. Then that would have told me without a doubt that it was going on a long move. And I'm sure on this one, just bouncing off settlement, I was looking for a short move just up to the top of the um, chop box here. What's ice telling me here? Um, well, you can see that it, in, in this, um, on this chart, it's chopping at these big volume. You see how the histogram shows we had big volume lines of ice, okay? And it goes down to the bottom of this uh, vol histogram. It goes down to the bottom of the big volume and that happens to be settlement. Below settlement, if it's gonna cross settlement, it's really likely to go to here, to these, this big node, but it didn't cross settlement. It went up and so it's, it's bouncing in all these big nodes, around all these big volume nodes, lines. Then when it breaks, what happened to our volume? It broke and went right through. It's kind of like that ice skating that we talk about. You skate through these volume nodes that are very small and it went up and I don't, I don't know if it kept going or what, but you can see that it did put in a mini magnet here telling us and then it bounced off the mini magnet here. So that really would have been a good indication. You could take at least a scalp short because you had a, a mini magnet on the first one and then it came down, tested it and bounced off it again and VAD was dropping off completely. So it looks like, yeah, the VAD expected volume started to, well, it was pretty consistent. 
So I, I love to, to use this ice histogram to give me an idea of what it's going to do. And when it, you can see this little bit longer node is pretty close to where it started to um, do a little bit of chopping. Okay, let me catch some questions here. Um, okay, I think I got them pretty much pretty much um, caught up. And Kelly S says, I had a divergence entry. Yeah, it really is. That's in a trend. Um, and you had a little trend there, and then you had a retrace, and VAD just died out. So that would be, I guess maybe that's what you meant by an old-fashioned VAD A divergent entry. Yep. When it bounced off a settlement, I mean a huge, huge, okay, sorry John, I wasn't understanding what you were asking there. I mean, you got you got a huge level, and it's bouncing off exactly. That is, I mean, that that doesn't get any better than that. Well, it does, but I like that. Thank you, Kelly. We're going on an hour. I want to keep it pretty reasonable today. I I have so much more to cover, but I wanted to just touch on the basics. And um, I think we're going to do. We'll I'll do some more of these. And we'll go over some more questions. People wanted um, help more on reading divergent or reading VAD, sorry, and reading chop and determining chop and drawing the chop box. And um, so that is some of the other stuff that I want to cover. It is there's so much to cover, and if I have a five-hour long webinar, nobody's going to want to ever watch it and pay attention. But this. Your, your feedback really helps us know what we need to um, cover in more depth in the trainings because we don't know what you don't understand. I mean, I kind of thought that the forum post was really self-explanatory and when I start seeing people's charts, I was like, whoa, you're not understanding that. And, this is confusing and okay, we got to take a breath here and reteach some of this stuff because it's not as clear as I thought it was, but okay, no problem, we can do that. I just, I just pulled this chart up because someone asked, I'm just going to real quick run over a couple of, of things about CHOP. We've got some, we can't, we got a cluster. In fact, we've got two clusters. If we were going up here in NQ, you've got a cluster. Okay, pay attention. That's what it tells me. Here's a little bit of a tip. We got two mini magnets pulled in. And you're going up and you got a cluster. Okay, and so it's pay attention. We don't know what's going to happen, but something is. Then two bars later, we've got another cluster and a divergent bar. It means our bar closed up, but we had a net red, which means we had more cell bars, but yet the bar closed up. And that doesn't tell us anything directly. When I first saw those, I thought, hmm, that must mean that if they, if the reds couldn't, if we couldn't get any cl any more, if the green up close by contracts overtook the red that must mean that we're gonna go up so we'll just no it doesn't it just tells you something different is happening you got a divergent bar and you got a cluster bar now some people are having a lot of luck with uh, scalping that and it's a sling so technically if they wanted to if you wanted to scalp it you could usually get I don't know if you could probably get 10, 10 ticks you may be able to might be something worthwhile. I don't know. I've kind of stopped doing that myself so much because these power play setups are usually the really good ones that don't fail too often and give you a lot of ticks. So I've gotten to where I don't do so many of these, but maybe might do it. But for me, it's going to be telling me to pay attention. So then it comes up here and you've got some previous mini magnets and yet now it laid down another one. So this right here is going to be what I am assuming is my chop. I don't know yet if it's going to chop. I don't know what it's going to do. But at this point, I'm going to look for 
this bottom fresh mini magnet to this top fresh mini magnet as a chop zone. I don't know if that's what's going to happen or not, but tentatively speaking, for me, that's going to be what I'm going to look at. And in the end on this one, it just happened to go there exactly. But you have another one here. I kind of, you know, is this going to be your chop box? Is this going to be your chop box? Who knows? On this one, we don't really have, I don't have VAD, so I can't, I can't read what that was doing. I don't know. Um, I'm not even sure what the C's chart look like that goes with this. But I wanted to kind of talk about the chop box just a little bit because the chop box is where it is going to chop around. And you don't know at the time, but you can kind of make some guesses as far as pay attention. Here's a mini magnet and here's a mini magnet. Now, if you are not trading the C's with um, diagnostic bars, if you are one of the people that likes your um, order prints on time-based, the mini magnets are not as strong on those. So you have to be really careful. You'll have a lot more mini magnets in a time-based. But so anyway, for me, I would tend to look, pay attention and, and watch these, either of these two lines and this line for my chop. But if the mini magnets were not there, I would tend to think, okay, this is my first chop box right in here. And then here it came down and exceeded a little bit. I don't know what VAD did there, so I can't say that, you know, I would have to guess that there was less volume based on the cluster here, and there was less volume coming in here, so I would tend to think there's probably less VAD, but I don't, I don't know. So that's, as soon as it starts chopping, you can make a tentative little chop box with whatever, I mean, even here to here, you've got different color bars, so I kind of have an imaginary little chop box right here. Well, it brought it down, so I'm gonna, you know, just watch the chop. The chop is just moves that oscillate around. Sometimes it's real tight oscillation, sometimes it's not. You're getting six to ten ticks on those little ones, Larry. That's good. On the on the uh, going with the close of the cluster and taking those like on a sling and stuff. That's good. Okay, so does anybody else have questions on reading the VAD or especially off a mini magnet? I agree to that. Or any other thing that you want me to quick go over? It's just a little over an hour, so I can go over a, one or two little quick things, but I don't want to be too much longer and then we can do this again. And I ultimately would like to end up doing putting replay on and actually looking for these setups real time. Well, on replay, but what's your best idea to avo avoid false chop breakouts? Um, I just, VAD is my best to watch for the false chop because if you had, usually you'll have less volume or um, here's the other thing with VAD on the chop. Um, this is not a very good example, but it is a little bit. You see how this one, when it's coming down, is so little. And then this one is much bigger compared to this one. It's really not that big, but compared to this one. And it can't go anywhere. It cannot exceed anything. Okay, so when the first bar in VAD to a, in, in CHOP, when the first bar in VAD is really big, to me that is like, it's telling me it's gonna go fast and it's gonna burn out. So I want a slow, steady climb. If it's really small, it's not going anywhere, usually. If it's really big on the first bar, that is a, that, that's a red flag to me because the first bar you usually, you want a slow and steady build up. Those are the ones that work the best. And we saw one, one of my examples where the VAD didn't actually exceed at breakout, but it had been a steady climb and it wasn't 
totally teeny tiny. So it's it's just really getting a read for it. Um, uh, it's subjective a little bit there, I hate to say, but little tiny vat on both sides indicates we got some chop going. And even though here you had one little teeny tiny and a couple more, well, you had a couple of little bars of, you had a little bit of chop right there. And then it takes off and tells you, yeah, strong trend again. You always compare it if you have, um, and I don't know where I have a good example of it, but try to compare the trend uh, to similar size trends, the VAD bars to similar size trends. Because you can't compare one little tiny one to a really big one. You're going to have smaller VADs on a smaller trend, generally. Let's see, how many ticks would you, the price have to break beyond the chop box before it's classified as a false break versus confirming the trade or nullifying it? Um, really good question. Generally, a fake break doesn't happen. Um, it depends on what you're... It really depends on the, the... If you're looking for big, big trends or if you've just got a small trend. Um, the example there would be if it breaks out five ticks and it dives back in, that's going to be a fake break. It's going to be enough to lure people in so they get stopped out and then it'll come back in and you know. But sometimes you'll see, for example, this case where it came up and then it comes back down to the same part the same point and it goes up you could kind of count this as a fake break it went up it lured people up and then it came down and crushed everybody's stops and it went back up so you, it's really it's it's hard to tell i don't know how many ticks this was 56 up to 81 so it was mm, 25 a hundred ticks, okay? Yep, a hundred ticks. That's a really nice move. So to have this be cons I would I would consider this a fake break, but yet it's not a fake break out of tight chop. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard to explain. It's a false start, I guess, more than a fake break because there wasn't really any chop to break out of here. And in every big move, you're going to have either a fake break or a false stance, a false start. Almost every break, every good trend, you're going to see that. And I actually like, that's why I like to wait and see what the market's telling me to do. Um, patience is the key. And man, that's a hard thing to learn. But if you, if you look here, I mean, it really is kind of a false start. It's trying to go up, can't do it, comes right back down, gets more energy, bounces off here, and then it really goes. And it wants to come back and test that level a little bit. Somewhat again, pretty close to that level. Um, you have a feeling it's more that has to do with watching them over time rather than a hard set roll. Yeah, it really is. I mean, generally, out of tight chop, a fake break will only be maybe five ticks or something. It really won't be a whole lot, usually. Um, there's always always exceptions to everything. Drives you crazy, but there is. And um, if your stop's big enough, then you can withstand it. I hate those big stops if I can help it, but but you have to have a stop that's going to fit your trade. I mean, some people try to do a 10 tick stop all the time. They'll just, no matter what it is, it's 10 ticks. Well, they're gonna get stopped out more than they don't. And that's a promise. They absolutely will. Okay, any other quick questions? And then we'll wrap it up. Do I have any thoughts on using smaller bars like six ticks to scalp during non-trending afternoons? Um, that works for some people. And some people really like that. Um, non-trending afternoons is probably the best time to use that. 
Um, it, it probably shows you you're going to be in and out faster, and probably the same things will hold true. You can read your chop, you know, when it's going to break out of chop or whatever. That's probably not a bad idea. I tend to not like to change my bar size, but that's just me. I know people that put the bar sizer on and they go with the size of bar that it's recommending for the day and they do very well. For me, I don't, I like to just, I don't care what it is, summer, fall, winter, I don't care what it is. I like my bars to stay the same personally, but that's just my preference. And just because I like it doesn't mean anything. I used to change my bar size at night when I was trading at night. Now I haven't traded at night for a long time, so. Where's the bar sizer? It's a indicator. Let me move this out of the way slowly so I don't have it there. Hopefully that didn't drive you guys too crazy with indicators. Where is it? Okay, I don't even remember now. I thought it was up. Oh yeah, bar sizer. Okay, diagnostic. That's where we go. There we go. And up in the corner, it tells you if you're looking at. You know, for large bars, 36, 18, or small for 9. So 9 is pretty close to my 10. I'll stick with my 10. But I know people that put that up every day, and they tell you, um, it'll tell them what, what they need to know for the day, and it works. So Apex tools are absolutely amazing. Any other questions? Are the power plays my main trades now? Not so many C's anymore. Yep. Well, they are. It is all C's, really. It's the breakout of chop. It's the um, it's the reversals and it's bounces. It's the same things. It's just using a little more information from OP and reading the VAT a little bit better. It's just a little more evolved from what it originally was. It's still. I've been trading C's for three years. And it still sees it's just a little more evolved. It keeps on changing, and I imagine it keep it will continue as we have more things developed. It's just gonna I, I like it laser focused. And we've got some more indicators that we're working on that will help determine um, some of these divergence and things like that. That'll help you see it a little more clearly. <laughs> Love it, Ivar. Okay, anything else? Um, but yeah, I don't do many of the the just the slings and elevators all by themselves anymore. I still do those in the swings. I do them if I've if I've missed a power play. I'll still get on and um, grab those because that's that's the way I can get in and get in on that big play. And I tend to look more for a scalp for those. Oh good, I'm, I hope it helped. And we will be doing some more. We just got to have a, I wanted to kind of have a order to do it in, sort of, more or less. So, do I mostly watch? I do anymore. I mostly watch NQ. I have been getting all my ticks within my first hour, usually on NQ, thanks to the power plays. For the most part, they um, it's been volatile enough, and even in the summer, I know everybody says they hate summer trading, but I like it. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. I, I prefer summer anymore. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up, and we'll get this um, on the in the forum. 
Um, actually, I'll get it in the forum under THTs, and I'll post the link under C's as well. So it will be probably at the bottom of the C's um, power play, so you can watch it with that if you go looking in the forum. And I'm going to keep looking for screenshots. I just ran out of time today, so I kind of threw some up that aren't necessarily the best in there right now, but at least there's something to give you some examples. Okay. Have a great evening. Bye, guys.